uh, bright and early this morning. Um, this session is on partnerships, and in particular, putting into practice two different partnership models, um, co-programming and co-funding. Now, the European Commission and individual philanthropic organisations both aim to have maximum impact on society, and there's no doubt that closer working could help achieve this. However, each faces, as you know, a number of barriers in entering partnerships, be it legal, geographic, governance, mission orientated. So we're here today to discuss what sort of partnerships are possible and can we break down those barriers. To brainstorm this, and I really want to make this a brainstorming session, I want to sort of move ahead, look to the future and look at what governance we could have, what kind of partnership models are possible. Um, I've got with me Irene Norstedt, Acting Director from the People Directorate Department for Research and Innovation. Uh, Alberto Amfonsi, uh, Secretary General of the Campagna di San Paolo, and Stefan German, CEO from the Botner Foundation. Now, I'm going to start with Irene, and first of all, uh, the People Directorate is quite new. Uh, it's very broad, mm -hmm. uh, it covers health, digital, culture, creativity, tell me if I'm missing anything out, inclusive society. What, do you th what new opportunities do you think Horizon Europe offers um, in terms of partnerships? And um, what does it do that Horizon 20 didn't? Mm -hmm. So uh, in uh, Horizon Europe, uh, we have structured the partnerships uh, in sort of three big type of categories. You mentioned two, but we can even go into three actually. Um, that really opens up how we cooperate with foundations. Uh, we already have quite a lot of experience in the health area to work with foundations, and we have actually built on that for how we can do it in Horizon Europe. So the first way you can do it is really in a a sort of a, in, in sort of a co-programmed partnership. That means that we can agree on common objectives. Each one of us are using our own tools uh, to invest, you know, with our normal procedures, etc. But we work and we agree on common objectives. We can agree on a memorandum of understanding or another type of arrangement. Uh, but the principle is that we agree on what we're going to achieve. And then each one of us works sort of side by side and we work together in that way. So that's kind of the simplest way you can say. Then we have the, the joint co-fund, uh, where we can go in and co-fund uh, with you. Uh, it means that you would come together um, to define a program, uh, and then we come in and we co-fund with you. Uh, then we have sort of another type of partnership, which is what we call the institutionalized partnership. And there are two types of those as well. Uh, one is a partnership we have is called Article 185. It allows the European Union to go to co-invest in member states programs. So it's really to work with member states research funders. But of course, foundations can come in in addition to those programs. Uh, and then we have the Article 187 that allows the union to go in partnership with basically anybody to pursue common objectives. And we have used that instrument to establish, in particular, public-private partnerships. And uh, we have seen that this is a really good mechanism also for bringing in foundations, because in a uh, institutionalized partnership like the public-private partnerships we have, and I take IMI as one example, because here is where we really have managed to draw in a lot of foundations. Uh, what, what, what is IMI? IMI is the Innovative Medicines Initiative, and it's a public-private partnership between the European Union and the pharmaceutical sector. And when we created the second version of that one, we created something called Associated Partners, which actually we thought was for other industry sectors, but it turned out it was a beautiful instrument to actually draw in foundations. Uh, so there, the foundation can come in either to invest in kind in research, together with the other partners, or it can also give a cash contribution because such a partnership is, has a legal entity, which means it has its own bank account. So there you can also go in uh, and provide a cash contribution and go in and co-fund directly the project. So there are different means of doing that. And these are the experience that we really are drawing on for Horizon Europe to go in and work on partnerships with foundations. Okay, thank you. Um, Alberto Alfonsi, um, we've heard the three 
different models there. Mm -hmm. And we also heard yesterday of a great desire to move much more further to co-creation. Um, what would you add to the kind of um, conditions laid out? Yeah, uh, <coughs> I would start from... Uh, I, don't, I will start from an, um, an exper past experience. And it's not working. Is it working? No. Mm. Here. Sorry, strike. No. Not working. <laughs> See, <Yeah>. now. No. <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. okay, no. sorry. <laughs> uh, I would start uh, quickly uh, <coughs> with the past experience we had as a foundation in a JPI, so a Joint Programming Initiative, the, the one on cultural heritage, which was uh, led by, coordinated by Italy. And uh, <coughs> we uh, were asked to, to be part of this JPI mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. to help the coordination uh, activities of Italy. And so we started, we made a, a formal agreement with, the, with the, the Italian ministry and we started a meeting with all the other European partners. And I have to say that uh, at the beginning, the, the reaction wasn't so positive from the other uh, member mm -hmm. states because, I mean, there, there is a lot of, I mean, in theory, uh, foundation are okay, but then some kind of doubts come, come in. Uh, are you really independent? Are, are you uh, really pri are you private, but for the public good? Uh, what about conflict of interest? You fund a local institution. Are you going to advocate, uh, do advocacy for them here? No, you know. So my experience wasn't so positive mm -hmm. at the moment, but uh, I'm, I'm saying this now because I think we have overcome all of this mm -hmm. because of the work of the Commission and uh, I mean, I would like to commend the, the Commission mm -hmm. for that. Uh, now we, have, we are part uh, of the legal framework, uh, the, the partnership mentioned foundations, and so mm -hmm. this is very good. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, the, in the future we would, uh, wouldn't have the, such kind of problems. Why uh, did you want to take part? What, what was it that wanted, made you want to partner with this? We want to partner for <coughs> a series of reasons. One is to, to, to uh, enhance impact. We are uh, kind of uh, obsessed by impact, by uh, making our money work uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the idea of uh, partner with uh, European Commission and with other uh, member and public uh, institutions uh, would for sure enhance uh, the impact of our interventions. Um, and then we think that, uh, I mean, the philanthropy history is uh, the w one of collaboration, of cooperation, of giving uh, some kind of uh, personal uh, decision uh, power given uh, out to have a, a, a common denominator and to do things together. So this is, <laughs> but coming to uh, having to your questions, question. I, I, I think that, uh, that we are on a good path. Uh, we need, uh, I, I think, examples, more examples, mm -hmm. more uh, use. Let's say use case pilot mm -hmm. uh, through 2020. Mm -hmm to uh, really understand uh, these three or four uh, ways, how mm -hmm. do uh, they work mm -hmm. in practice? Uh, because, uh, you know, the, um, the landscape of foundation is, is very uh, is wide. We, we, there are uh, very big foundations, very sm small foundations. But uh, if we want to have the sector engaged, um, we need uh, to be able to explain to everybody how it works. Mm -hmm. It's not possible to have just one or two foundations involved that know very well how to, mm -hmm. to get involved, but we need everybody to, to re understand the, 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 mm -hmm. these three levels, how they work. And uh, let me just add one thing. Uh, also about uh, uh, thematic, the thematic, the themes of the, the, the scope of, of the um, partnerships. There are 44, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, uh, hypotheses of uh, partnerships. <laughs> of course, it's natural. They more, uh, they are, most of them look at uh, industry or academia and, mm -hmm. and not foundations, but, and this is uh, mm -hmm. perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, I mean, to set out, uh, how to say, to single out those where foundation can have a say, and, uh, and the overlap with what we do is uh, more uh, wide, wider. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll bring in Stefan Botner. There are lots of interesting things I want to uh, discuss mm -hmm. further there, but let, let's um, mm -hmm. just talk about you and partnerships. And um, foundations have been described as agile, and some are described as being prepared to take risks. Um, what do you think foundations can bring in terms of innovation, um, and how could the EU and philanthropies work together? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. I think with partnerships, we have to always sort of remind ourselves, you know, what, what do we want to achieve by partnerships? But increasingly, we realized in a, in a relatively <coughs> complex world that no single sector, mm -hmm. whether the public sector or private sector or civil society, can really tackle mm -hmm. these issues on its own. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when partnerships are required. As the African proverb says, with, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go mm -hmm. together. And it has mm -hmm. to do with that. You know, mm. partnership is not always the best thing, but if you really want mm. to tackle complex issues that need to be addressed at scale mm. in a sustained manner, then mm. partnerships are critical. As foundations, mm. I think we are in that special intersection between mm. the public space, the private space, and mm. civil society, and actually have an important role to catalyze mm. and, and convene and sort of nibble and enable. Mm. Uh, on the risk side, um, I mean, there's thousands of foundations across Europe. I actually think there's only a few who are really, you know, pushing the risk boundary. Uh, many of us, um, and there is this sort of a, a, somebody in the U.S. at Harvard did a paper on on philanthropy and the, the thought of institutionalized dishonesty. <laughs> And it has to do with that those who sort of receive support mm. from foundations, they want a good story. The program officers in the organizations, they want a good story. Mm. I'm as a CEO, one from my program officer, a good story. And my board wants from me a good story. And the board wants that the public has a good story. So that tends, lends itself to sort of uh, not quite pushing the boundaries. And, and so I you know, say, okay, are we really risk taking if out of 10 initiatives, eight actually succeed and we kind of pat our shoulder? Probably not. I mean, innovation and risk taking has much higher sort of failure quotas. And so how can we collectively work together to sort of really enhance that appetite? And that's what is quite welcoming, I think, with the last sort of five years where uh, you know, the commission related to sort of research innovation really has started to create an enabling environment for foundations with the European Commission around research innovation to come together. And it's quite exciting looking forward for the next five years what we can do together. And later on, I will sort of talk about a very practical example that's very early stage where this sort of collaboration between foundations, European Commission, member states and others can illustrate how, hopefully, through that sort of collaborative partnership space, something great can be achieved in the next three years. That's great. I really do want to go to, into examples in a bit, but I, I saw you nodding vigorously there um, a little bit earlier when you were hearing about the challenges mm -hmm. involved and, and how mm -hmm. that was resolved. Mm -hmm. Do you have any perspective on that at all? Yeah, I think what's really important to remember is when you go into the partnership, you may have the best will in the world to achieve something together, but each one of us has our rules and expectations, uh, both in the way how we fund research, you know, uh, in the uh, for the for our framework programs, you know, we always need to run open calls for proposals. You have some foundations who also run open calls for proposals, but you have other foundations who want to give a direct grant. So, you know, each organization has its own rules how to give out the money and also ha may have its own rules of how to use the results. You may have access conditions in the results. All of this you really need to think about before you go into the partnership and you need to think about what do you want to achieve and what would then be the best type of partnership that you can work under and you know, would it be to work, you know, invest side by side to complementary activities or would it be that you would put sort of money into a big pot to achieve sort of one big thing? It, there are a lot of aspects there that you really need to think about, and it can be quite challenging. Most of the cases we really, you know, can resolve those, but there may be cases where we cannot. But we can always work side by side 
but then we need to work on complementary reactions. I would say an area where we have come quite far in terms of engaging foundations to work together is in the area of rare diseases, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where we have a long-standing collaboration, uh, not only between sort of public funders and foundations, but also between foundations. Um, we actually have an example here, so if you don't mind, no, I would ahead. actually like to invite uh, Lucia can Monaco from the Teleton Foundation. Who, can you um, throw the cube, or perhaps I can? Maybe I'll can give you a microphone. That might be so, easy. So, uh, also to explain, Lucia is Thank also you. the chair of uh, the International Rare Diseases yeah. Research Consortium, where we yeah. do fund side by side. Yeah. But you're also a member of a co-fund. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Irene. I Thank don't think the microphone's mm. working. Is, can we just put that one on? Is it working? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Irene. I think that um, I totally subscribe with what you said uh, regarding uh, the boundaries that each no, foundation... It doesn't work. Close to the mouth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay, thank you. I totally subscribe to what uh, you said about uh, each foundation having uh, very specific boundaries. Mm -hmm. So making it quite difficult to work together in programs uh, with uh, co-funding uh, or with common initiatives, but what the baseline uh, should be for everyone interested is uh, to work at common objectives. So to identify gaps in the specific area, and uh, we can talk about mm -hmm. rare diseases, but uh, I'm sure each foundation mm -hmm. and each stakeholder has its uh, specific one. Mm -hmm and to identify gaps and to pull together competencies uh, and uh, to synergize uh, on uh, strategies. That is important because each one can go back home and, uh, and then implement what has come out from this uh, sharing. This is what is happening in IRDIRC, the International Rare Disease Research Consortium that was uh, started by the European Commission together with the NIH and now comprises uh, nearly 60 members uh, mm. from all around the globe and uh, the mm. European presence is uh, really predominant and very important there, not only because there are many funding members, there are companies in there, there are patient organizations, but also because uh, uh, the Commission is uh, supporting uh, the management of IRDIRC through a dedicated scientific secretariat that is part today mm of uh, a, the European Joint Programme on Rare Diseases. So this is an initiative that is, uh, uh, is uh, based on the concept of uh, having different stakeholders working at a common theme from different points of view. So there are different pillars mm. that include co-funding of uh, uh, grants throughout uh, Europe, but also building a platform mm. for sharing of data and resources in connection and collaboration with the European reference networks for rare diseases. There is a, a, a pillar dedicated to training, both for patients, for, for, uh, uh, also for scientists, and a pillar dedicated to the development and the exploitation of results up to clinical uh, results. And uh, many partners are there. We are 89 mm. partners, mm. including uh, foundations like Teleton Foundation, that is the organization mm. I work for in Italy, that can uh, contribute its experience in managing mm. research on rare diseases and developing programs mm. up to available therapies. So there are examples where the situation is really very complex, but it can be uh, put uh, to benefit uh, of mm. this specific mm. theme. So thank you, Eric, thank for you. giving this. <laughs> thank you for that. So, um, uh, Stefan mm. German, do, 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 you, do you think that's, that's a very big partnership? Um, does there need to be a lead partner for a start? Um, how, how would it work? How, where are the synergies? Mm. Well, let me get in terms of partnerships. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge that actually from a human capacity point of view, we probably don't have enough people who really have the competencies and the skills and the experience to really broker and, and mm -hmm. facilitate mm -hmm. uh, trisectoral partnerships, mm -hmm. specifically if it involves sort of government, uh, but as well private sector and mm -hmm. civil society actors. And it starts with language. The different sectors have different language. There are very different accountability mm -hmm. mechanisms. So, you know, government related mm -hmm. agencies or like the European Commission has more political and sort of, you know, 
uh, election cycle accountability mechanisms. Private sector has more shareholder accountability mechanism, and civil society is more member and constituency accountabilities. And, and ethically, we underestimate, I think, even as foundations as well, the need to invest into building capacity of people in organizations to actually broker and facilitate. And, and those people who have that, some are natural at that, but many not. And it's this sort of can-do and solution-focused attitude that is very much needed. And if you take such a you know, complex with 89 partners, mm -hmm. You know, unless you have a core of a number of mm. sort of drivers, and quite often it's individuals. So you know, it's, exactly. it, it, it requires individuals who, who are passionate, are committed, but as well have an, an attitude of, there are issues, but what are the solutions? Quite often things start to break down when people start to always just look at, mm. oh, it doesn't work because of this, it doesn't work of this. And I must say, sort of, the Wellcome Trust as a good example, and, uh, and, and, and Jeremy was on the lunch yesterday, mm -hmm. the CEO of Wellcome Trust. You know, they worked very closely to find, mm -hmm. there are sometimes loopholes in the systems that you mm -hmm. can make it work. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have people who have that sort of can-do and solution-focused attitude to look at where are the niches that you can make it happen, mm -hmm. You know, it's too easy to say, well, we just cannot do it, and you know, let's just walk away. And I think that's sort of what we need collectively to encourage is to encourage people to, it, it is a bit of risk taking individually, institutionally, <laughs> and, and then we can really achieve significant things together. Okay, Alberto. Um, that example of rare diseases is an example of a common goal. Everyone is working towards a common goal, but it, you earlier talked about large and small foundations with very different aims. Um, how do you think we could make partnerships work for, for everybody? Are there some people who aren't just going to take part because they're too small? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think we have to acknowledge the, the debt. The, the fact that probably is not for everybody, is not for all the, the foundation systems. Uh, it's the same, but I think it's normal. It's like uh, uh, Horizon uh, Europe or Horizon 2020 or FP7, mm -hmm. who wasn't for every university, every research body in, in Europe. Somebody wins, goes there, applies, wins. Mm -hmm. And even in the, the foundation world, uh, th there would be there will be something uh, like this. Somebody will, but uh, what our aim uh, as let's say leaders of this uh, conversation is the fact to have the, the, the most the most there the, the the highest number of foundation being involved in this process, and so uh, that's why we from the first day uh, are keep saying that uh, we are very different, we have uh, different uh, laws, each mm -hmm. uh, country has its own law for, for foundations, and uh, scope and, and local rules. But nevertheless, as uh, he was saying, uh, we can find ways to, to have uh, a, a reasonable uh, number of foundation cooperating on specific uh, goals in partnership or missions. What, what, so let's talk about missions now, because you mentioned it there. So wh what areas would, you, would your foundation be able to work in? Because you presumably just cover Italy. Are you yeah. able to work anywhere else or fund anything else? Well, uh, we do fund uh, projects uh, abroad. We, we fund a lot of projects uh, uh, in Africa, for example. We fund. Uh, we are partner in the NEF, the network of European foundation that uh, has thematic networks, funding projects at European European level. At even in Italy, we co cooperate with the other sister foundation in Italy to have uh, national programs. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, the, our law in Italy uh, says that uh, a foundation like uh, Compagni San Paolo should uh, care about the local uh, environment. So we have to keep the balance between these two uh, drivers. Okay, thank you. Um, Irene, so do you think the new, the new mission approach will, mm -hmm. will enable partnerships mm -hmm. more? Mm -hmm. I think so, because the missions are aiming to really have a clear focus on delivering something for society uh, in their respective areas. Of course, the final scope of those is under 
definition. So it's a great time to also contribute to that. But once this has landed and we know this is what they're going to deliver, I think that it will be serving as great focal points for everybody who wants to contribute to achieve those areas to come together. And there, I think partnerships and the different modes of partnerships we have could be a really good tool to, to deliver on those. Um, I would like to mention another aspect, which I think is really important and where we as public funders can learn a lot from the foundations, and that is how to engage with stakeholders mm -hmm. and how to really reach out to the citizens and work together uh, in the engagement and in the communication. So, I mean, one thing is the research funding or innovation funding aspects, but I think there are other areas we also can collaborate, which is not really about the money we spend, so to say, but where we can really reach out because we want to pursue common objectives uh, and where we can work in complementarity. Okay, and what about you? Do you think the mission approach is going to help? I mean, you have a very particular focus in your foundation. Yeah, I think we, this will tremendously help. And, and so one thing, we've started a dialogue with the European Commission related to the Next Horizon program is, is an initiative that, mm -hmm. that has only the last sort of six months started to emerge. There, there is a growing recognition that artificial intelligence in health, which is an area that we as a foundation very much focus on, mm -hmm. uh, has tremendous potential, but has as well major issues that need to be tackled to really leverage mm -hmm. its full pot, you know, power in the next sort of 20 to 30 years. And the World Health Organization recently restructured itself and they're setting up a, a strong digital as well a data science unit. And so within that sort of dialogue, uh, the idea emerged uh, out of Geneva, sort of a global health capital, of the need to have like a CERN that was done in the 50s for, for nuclear sort of uh, science pooling of you know, the best brains and the best resources to set up an international AI for health research collaborative that really looks at bringing private sector, because there's a lot of research in that field, cutting edge is in the private sector, but as well top academic institutes from different countries together, and really sort of start to pool the financial resources and look at where are the best competencies for research within the space of AI and health. And, and that has to deal with, you know, very basic issues, like how do you sort of pre-qualify and validate changing algorithms in the diagnostics field. They, they constantly change. It's not like medicines in the past, which you once approved them, they stay the same. It's very dynamic environments. Digital trust in health, there's deep, deep questions that we need to tackle. And so this can only be done through a collective partnership effort. And so as a foundation, we, we have been able to partner with a number of governments and some other foundations and in discussions with the European Commission is how can we, over the next two, three years, incubate something like this and then launch it. Uh, and it's tremendous to see the interest from the Indian government. They just set up an, an intergovernmental working group to support it. French government is very interested, the, the German government, Swiss government. Brazilian government, even you know, governments who traditionally said, well, we don't have research money. So the Minister of Health of Tunisia, when he heard on this initiative, said, yeah, we really want to be part of it. We can probably not provide much finance, but we can put in data that is annotated, labeled quality data. And so there you know, is potential to create for health-related sort of research on AI, uh, like a health data marketplace for, for, for science. And, and this can only be achieved by working closely with the Commission, with other foundations, with private sector, and establish eventually sort of a multi-stakeholder uh, constituency-based platform to drive this forward in the years to come. And I think that is an example where partnerships, and I think foundations are sometimes probably rightly accused by the sort of public sector that foundations innovate in a bubble on their own. And when it's successful, they kind of do advocacy work and put pressure and then expect that the public sector takes it to scale and sustains it in the future. And, and that, that happens when the sort of partnerships are not happening from the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
And it's kind of not fair to, to leave the government somewhere out there and you just do it yourself because it's more, more agile and quicker. And then when you have success, kind of expect the government to take it on and run with it. No. So we really need upfront to be working together in the co-creation. And I think that the new sort of program moving forward really gives that space for, for co-creation to think mm -hmm. together and actually sort of uh, leverage mm -hmm. innovation through a research approach much stronger. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to bring in some questions. Um, put your hand up. Yes, there's two there. Yes, we have a cube, which is, if you turn around, you're going to catch the cube or maybe it'll be carried to you, I'm not sure. Lady there, and then the gentleman in front of her. Um, yes. Hi. Is it is it working? Yep. Hold it closely Hold it close to your okay. okay. I'm uh, Miriam Tavalegi from Atalis Funding Run Database, and because of my work, we can see abroad um, many many kinds of schemes and foundations, etc. And I think that besides uh, this kind of uh, cooperation, uh, we cannot forget that foundations are actually doing a big work uh, funding junior scientists. Mm -hmm. We have a huge gap because uh, the commission is always is very focused on excellence, and I understand that. But many scientists cannot access this level, and it's very important to have trampoline grants with uh, a little money, so you can start managing because you can be a great scientist, but maybe you cannot manage three million euros. So I think that with the mobility grants. They foster Curie fellows, and there are many gaps that their foundations can 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 cover. And I think that it's very important that they keep doing that. Okay. So. And there's a gentleman in front of you who's yeah. got a question, and I'll put you. I'll ask you to respond. The panel to respond. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Santi from La Paz University Hospital, <laughs> and I will also stress the the importance that has the European Commission. Uh, to set up standards. Uh, I come from uh, a field that is childhood cancer in which uh, we've seen uh, many, many uh, ephemeral <coughs> foundations, charities that usually are created to help one specific child by the family. And after, uh, normally they, they convince in foundations that uh, help memorial from uh, that child. Um, they put a lot of money, money from I don't know, the people on the ground, hairdressers, Tom Masons, policemen, the uh, amount, huge, uh, huge uh, amounts of money, but only five, ten years, and do fund uh, young scientists, PhD students, etc. But they have a very low impact, as, as they are not prepared to, to clearly establish the goals, because they are rooting mud out of patient that from reason. And I think that it is it's a quite extended uh, issue in, in Europe and also in the US uh, about this kind of uh, foundation. And, and maybe the European Commission can um, help them to put that money in a way that uh, the impact is more, more really achieved. Thanks. Okay, so two similar questions in some ways about filling the gaps. The European Commission, a direct question there, is it something the European Commission could help? That? I mean, this is something, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, partnerships. Once we agree on the goals, I mean, as we all can do things in different ways, we can address different gaps in different ways. I think these are typical examples that we would like to discuss with foundations and see, you know, how can we cover the whole arena, so to say, so that we can fill these gaps. And I, I think this was really... Uh, it, it's a perfect example, I would say. And, and similarly, foundations funding junior scientists or you know, people who perhaps wouldn't qualify for a big grant from the European Commission. Is that, is that something that could be enabled with partnerships? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like we, we have a small partnership with the European Commission linked to their sort of Africa uh, sort of pediatric research capacity building. And, and where we basically focus very much on, on these sort of younger, more junior scientists and enable them with, with smaller grants. And we are working on a call together with, the, with, with that program. That's then a matching funding between 50% from us and 50% through mm -hmm. that uh, European Commission supported program. And so there, there are many examples like this. I think, you know, one question the, the, the last person brought up 
is, is an, I think that is a bit of a challenge for foundations, and I don't think we have collectively figured out this, to, how do we do pooling of funding more effectively? Uh, and I think that's sort of an example with the with sort of the rare diseases. But I, I think in other areas we we really could do more. And and one thing, and that's not my quote, but a, a previous uh, organisation I worked with, a very large organisation uh, in a non-profit with 45,000 staff across 100 countries. The president once said something that really stuck to me. And he said. If we want to achieve really impact and, and great things, we have to leave egos and logos behind. Mm -hmm. And I think quite often yeah. as institutions and individuals, we are a bit stuck with egos and, and logos. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if we really want to move into creating more impact, we really need to sort of get out of that comfort mm -hmm. zone. Alberto, do you, do you have respond at all to yeah. that? Well, one. One answer is that I think uh, that any foundation w would never give up uh, their own programs to do this kind of new, new, new uh, partnerships or cooperation. So we are trying to align, we are trying mm -hmm. to uh, do things together uh, just because of the second point, to, to have more impact, to, to be less uh, auto-referential and uh, uh, to be more accountable. So that's uh, exactly the, uh, the aim. Uh, but uh, to come into the first questions, uh, question, uh, we will never give up on our programs that uh, we uh, are mm -hmm. running out, running, and, and that we think uh, are effective. Okay, I, th I know there was a question uh, there. Um, put your hand up. Don't this chap in the middle and then the one at the back. So, several questions. If you want to go to the, this one and the, oh. this, okay. <laughs> go on, we'll take, we'll take three. Uh, apologies. <laughs> well, yes, I, I would like, because we are, uh, well, Angel Honrado from We Do Projects, and, and, and I would like to go a little bit more on Close the, into, Yes, yeah. into the practical terms, actually, because there's been collaborations in, in Horizon 2020 already happening. I'm, I'm, I have in mind some collaborations in the IMI, GTI, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. and I think the big thing is about the expectations, because I would like to understand as well from, mm -hmm. from both sides how this is going to work. You, you talk about co-funding, you talk about you know, co-developing. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Specific calls, you both together, some of you guys being mm -hmm. in partnership within the consortia, and then you know, being a stakeholders, expecting what, monitoring closely, uh, you know, as they call us, expecting um, co-reporting, so to speak. So I would like to understand how is it going to work for us and decide yeah. that you guys are working together, which is great because that maximizes impact. But at the same time, I think it poses enormous challenges for managing the projects themselves and expectations of both sides, mm -hmm. yours and ours mm -hmm. as well. Thank right, you. thank you. Um, if you want to pass it to the... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had the cube beforehand, but um, he just beat me to it with the question. But it, it's a similar point to the mm. last uh, gentleman, uh, but taken from a different angle, perhaps. Um, we have to remember, I was heartened when Irene said that we have the 185 and 187 mm. articles were, 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 were referenced, and the IMI was referenced. And with regards to the JTIs, what we need to ensure is, is that for any partnership, simplification is crucial. That's the most important thing. It's very, very easy to overcomplicate a partnership, unnecessarily so. So its simplification is crucial. And I think on that point, there is a precedence. There's already systems that are in place that can simply be swapped around. Let me give you an example. One of the JTIs, the XL JTI, is a three-way tripartite partnership between industry, member states, and the European Commission. One puts in 50%, the other two put in 25% each, and a partnership comes in, very large projects. The exact same idea can simply turn around with member states, mm -hmm. philanthropic organizations, and the commission. Mm -hmm. and the exact same mm -hmm. idea. This system is already there. We're simply mm -hmm. removing one partner mm -hmm. and replacing it with another. So all I'd say mm -hmm. is that we need to make sure that it's really simple. Yeah. Thanks. OK, and I think there was a question in the corner at the back. Was anyone? Thank uh, you. I'm Vice President, University of Oslo. So I have a question for uh, especially um, Stefan German. Um, uh, you mentioned several of the um, uh, of, uh, uh, stakeholders, the European Commission, the foundations, 
but I didn't hear so much about how you see the role of universities mm -hmm. in, in formulating partnerships. Okay, so let, let's start with that question for you now. Yeah, I think that that is absolutely a critical component to it in terms of the, the universities. And in relationship to this uh, emerging uh, sort of uh, partnership called IDAR, the International AI sort of uh, for Health Research Collaborative, there is uh, an outreach very much to academic institutions across the different countries who have started to identify. And on the 4th of October is the first scientific consultation, which brings in exactly the academic partners. And then the emerging idea on the governance structure mm -hmm. would be that you have a multi-constituency where one constituency mm -hmm. are the research and academic uh, sort of organizations that are part mm -hmm. of this, this network. And a good example, the, in the UK, they have recently established uh, the Health Data Research UK, which basically clustered, uh, and that's focusing very much on data science and AI for health, and they clustered uh, all the universities in the UK into six clusters, and have mapped the core competencies, to, you know, where, who has which excellence. So some have excellence in, in more ethical societal questions around AI and health, others they have very much on the deep science in terms of computational power, and they basically then fan out the, 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 the financial resources on a sort of uh, distribution network that looks at where are the core competencies mm -hmm. uh, to really achieve the best results. And something like this, that model is then looked at for this emerging sort of international platform mm -hmm. that really would bring in the core competencies. Mm -hmm. um, so in generally partnerships, I think we, 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 we mm -hmm. probably need to be more specific that actually academic and research institutions have their own sort of voice and constituencies and lots to add and, and is sort of like an additional player within that ecosystem. So a very good point. Irene, um, let's go back to the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here mm -hmm. because uh, we're, we're talking about governance and mm -hmm. how is it going to work? <laughs> so. It depends on the type of partnership and it depends on the type of foundation and it depends on what you would like to achieve. Uh, so if you take the simplest version, which is, you know, the co-fund, uh, the co-programmed, uh, we each one would use our tools, uh, you know, to fund consortium. Uh, the consortia would report according to each one of our tools, and then, but we can facilitate for them to meet and to collaborate, uh, you know, with travel funds, etc., and to, to meeting, etc. Uh, so that is the simplest way of doing it. Uh, then you have sort of the most complicated way of doing it would be that we put money into one common pot, but that means that the foundation also need to have rules. You know, that would allow that to happen because then, uh, you know, it would be sort of some common rules that we need to, to, um, to apply. Um, and I think I would like to ask Pierre Merlien, who is actually the executive director of IMI, who has direct experience of this as well, how, how it has worked in practice. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Irene, for giving me the opportunity. Um, so I, I think in, uh, we have been very much at the coal face of, this, uh, of some of these mm -hmm. partnerships. So there are, there are a few uh, basic rules that I would just like to share. The first one is uh, form follows function. So uh, in getting a partnerships together, one should really look at the, you know, the end goals before we start thinking about governance or legislative framework or whatever, because that's going to, that's going to dictate what kind of partnership should be created. Should it be simple or more complex? The second thing is that it's not only about money. Um, uh, you know, the co-funding is great and, and we love it when we uh, look at Catherine because we work with the Gates Foundation, we work with Welcome, mm -hmm. Welcome Trust, we work with many other foundations and money is always great. But also these organizations bring a lot of expertise, mm -hmm. a lot of knowledge in, um, in how they work, how to reach out to people, how to do things. And that expertise is at least as important as cash. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're very much uh, into the some uh, foundations who are also research entities. I'm thinking of JDRF mm -hmm. and others who have active research. They bring a lot of in-kind and expertise as well as, as cash, as do industry players. 
uh, you know, I'm always saying that we are not really interested in cash coming from pharmaceutical mm. companies. We're interested in expertise, industrial expertise being integrated into our projects. And um, so the last thing I, I, I think I'd like to say is, and I'm always saying this, is that these, uh, the more complex partnerships um, uh, like IMI or other JTIs, uh, you know, it's not for everyone and it's not for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but for certain things mm -hmm. where there are so, where we can do things, as you were saying, uh, Stefan, at, at mm -hmm. scale and where uh, things uh, that are so important for the public good, mm -hmm. where we need to mobilize resource mm -hmm. from private and public sectors, these are the things where, so no surprise for IMI that we work a lot in antimicrobial resistance, which is a huge market failure. Mm -hmm. We do a lot in Alzheimer's disease, which is a, a scientific and clinical failure. Mm -hmm. So uh, these yeah. are the things that are in the sweet spots exactly. of these more complex exactly. partnerships. Yeah. And to comment what Pierre is saying there, uh, I, I think what's, what's really important is exactly what would you like to achieve? and the beauty of this kind of the strongest type of partnership which I my exemplifies which are the joint the GTIs or the joint undertakings the article 187 uh, is that you may because you co-own that type of partnership and you establish a legal entity that will implement the program and by doing that you kind of create a neutral broker because when you have different organizations coming with different ideas and backgrounds, you may want to have that kind of facilitator, so to say, that can help you to find the midway, etc. So uh, there are, coming back to that, you really need to think about what you want to achieve. But, but I think one area, and I'm mm. sympathetic sort of to the two gentlemen mm. who had that sort of question, I think mm. the, we, we do tend to forget the transactional costs of some of this. Mm. And uh, I've mm. been, I'm new to sort of foundation space operationally. Uh, I'm mm. only started two and a half years ago as a, the first CEO to set up the, this, this foundation management office. Before I was always on the receiving end. <laughs> and, and if we talk about the, the sort of like, you know, the, some of the complexities we have to deal, mm. the reporting, multiple reporting mm. for the same thing, I do think we need to sort of really on the side of, you know, like partnerships with the European Commission and with, together with other foundations, really find ways that we can really sort of a streamline a little bit more as, as good as we can in terms of the application process and, and, and then as well, once a grant is awarded, the reporting and the way we can collaborate together. But, but what sort of Pierre said, I think is, you know, is a good example in terms of really how sort of multi-stakeholder partnerships can really leverage and, and have, you know, much more impact. So we work quite a bit with the Gates Foundation, uh, especially on the digital sort of health side. And another good example, I just came back yesterday from uh, New York, where we had a high-level briefing of a forthcoming uh, joint commission between the Lancet and the Financial Times around AI, digital health and, and health data governance. That's going to be launched by the German uh, Minister of Health, Spahn, during the World Health Summit. And it's again an example how partnerships from a foundation, mm -hmm. we're working with the Wellcome Trust, the Children's Investment Fund mm -hmm. Foundation, then the Financial Times we brought mm -hmm. in, the Lancet, the Graduate Institute, an academic mm -hmm. partner, and really sort of within a year managed to get something really concrete up and going and that commission will sort of work for two years, works closely with mm -hmm. the European Commission on some of the issues uh, and OECD to really start to tackle some big questions that nobody really has answers related to health data governance. Um, so so there's, there's a goal there and yeah. you, you are, you've all got a common aim, but I suppose one of the questions was what does it mean for people at the receiving end, what, what do you think these new partnerships with, with foundation input now will, will actually mean? I, I think that the, to be fair, we have to answer we don't know. because, <laughs> And that's why we need the pilots and we need the more examples because we don't know. We, we are, at, are at the level of thinking how this can work. Uh, but I, I think I can guarantee at least it's our aim to make it simple, to make it simple even for us, because even for us would be a problem to have this kind of uh, 
uh, nightmare situation you were mentioning of with, with double reporting or uh, double ways or triple ways, <laughs> um, IP management and so on. <clears throat> so I, I think that there are very straightforward, straightforward ways that we already know. Uh, JPIs work like this. You have uh, this uh, common pot. Uh, you, you, I, I, there is a management uh, institutionalized. If uh, at least three, three countries, uh, three entities want to join uh, in, a, in, in a call, they put the money and then the three countries can apply, you know, the, the, the rules of the JPI. So this is very straightforward and is already tested, let's say. But here we are trying to think of something more, some some further uh, ways of collaboration. The, the, the co-creation we are, are thinking about is, is, is at the level of when you think calls, basically. No? And, yeah. uh, but, uh, uh, yeah. Maybe just to add, I mean, like, so yesterday there was uh, a lunch which was hosted by the outgoing commissioner, Moedas, uh, bringing together heads of European foundations with, uh, facilitated by the European Foundation Centre which really is great that they have sort of, you know, really entered that space. And, and I think there is, uh, there is now for the next phase, really, there are some of the, the challenges that the last sort of five years were there have been addressed from some legal policy issues. And now is really to, to, you know, start to co-create how do we best use that space. And, and I think we should probably challenge ourselves to use a human-centered design approach and actually work very closely with some of those who are more on the receiving end to, to create something that uh, then is actually working for all of us. Okay. Um, we're coming to a close quite shortly, but I just want to take any more questions at there. Oh, okay. There's two. There's one, uh, one at the front um, and one at the back. So if you start at the back and then we'll come to the front. Uh, who's got the cube? <laughs> Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, my name is Jerry Salol. I'm with the European Foundation Center. Uh, thanks for the praise. I wonder if we shouldn't be making it very clear that actually we're entering a new phase that uh, seems to be that foundations are being seen in a very different light and their diversity is being taken into account which therefore means there has to be, a, so I've been pretty euphoric over the last couple of days because I'm hearing from the, the commission that it understands that this diversity exists and that you need to be pretty flexible at this stage. This means a certain period, I think, of testing and a certain period of uncertainty. And I would just urge all of us not to ask for the blueprints before the actual testing of a, mm. a collaboration happens. Mm. Because the longer we can keep the blueprints away, the more likely we are to actually have a direction that we're all moving in in the same way. So it's just urging and thanking the Commission for actually taking the time to keep this as open as possible for as long as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. And we've got a question from the Gates Foundation. Uh, we, sorry, we've got the microphone. Thank you. Katrina Anderson from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we are about to uh, become an associated, active associated partner in one of the uh, IMI uh, programs, which we are very excited about. So what I'm curious about is in, in this new framework program, because what we experienced was there are some uh, limitations on, on, um, on, the, on this, the in kind spend that, that we have as foundation outside Europe in, in terms of matching. and. I was just wondering if you could speak mm. to how you are thinking about in this new framework programs mm. because that might actually put a limitation on uh, to which extent mm. that you'll be able to to collaborate with the mm. uh, with the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. Irene. Okay, so that is a, a uh, very very a specific question <laughs> related to the current IMI. No, no, in, what, how are you thinking about? So how okay because the the ceiling on international is very specific to that initiative. I mean, we have, for example, European developing uh, EDCTP, a European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, which is completely dedicated to working in Africa. Uh, so we do not have any prejudgment on that one. That again, we need to come back to the objectives. What would we like to achieve? So uh, we have, uh, you know, our program is open, uh, you know, throughout the world. 
Um, so uh, we don't have any. It's a very, very specific issue that is just for that particular partnership that the legislator has, uh, has uh, enforced. Okay, uh, Jerry, did you want to say something else? Or no, someone in front. <laughs> yeah, go on then. Hi. Okay, you can hear me. My name's Paula, and I work for Research Europe. And my question... Uh, yeah. Can you hear we can't me? hear you. Close to the mouth. Hello? Yep. Oh, yep. okay, you can hear. So my question relates to something that Stefan said earlier with uh, if you have... So it's uh, in relation to risk-taking. So if you have eight out of ten initiatives that are successful, um, maybe that's not necessarily a good thing uh, because that means you may not be taking enough risk. So I'd love to hear the commission standpoint on this, looking forward to Horizon Europe, you know, mm -hmm. what is a good um, outcome in terms of risk taking and successful initiatives? So is it five out of 10, two out of 10? I know it's hard to put a figure on it, <laughs> but you know, roughly. Maybe before well, Irene answers yeah, the, the so. question to you, I think the, <laughs> why I think as foundations we should push ourselves harder is that it's, it's much harder to take risk with taxpayers' money or with shareholders' money uh, in, in untested areas where there is market failure. And I do think that is a sweet spot where actually foundations really need to significantly invest, where there is sort of big bets uh, that are risky, where, where taxpayers' money does not, you know, can take that kind of risk. Or, or private sector, they basically say, well, the, you know, if the market then doesn't give the return, we, you know, we can't invest. Uh, and so I think the space here now where there is tremendous potential with a partnership between like the European Commission and Foundation is actually that the investment from the Foundation should to some extent do a bit of a de-risking on the Commission's investment to take bigger bets and higher risk. But, you know, there's a mechanism to it, but there's a mindset to it. And I think what we need to challenge collectively is the mindset. That actually, and, and you know, and I think I've been a long time out of Europe, I'm sort of back into Europe. I do think there's a cultural difference in terms of failure. I think for many here in Europe, mm -hmm. failure is seen as something really not good. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in other cultural settings, you know, if you haven't failed and, and you know, you really are not able to succeed at big mm -hmm. scale. And so we need to sort of challenge collectively a little bit that mindset and embracing failure. And as, 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 you know, as those different organizations, leaders, encourage young mm -hmm. people, researchers to, you know, to fail. Mm -hmm. and, but learn from it. You know, it's not about stupid failures. It's, it's learning from failure and create a, a failure culture. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's interesting, you know, uh, Gates Senior was the first one who endorsed the first failure report of Engineers Without Border to kind of really make that point. And unless we create a failure culture, we will not be able to push that, that boundary. Okay, just very so. briefly, do you want to try and answer that question at well, all? Well, it's a very difficult because, yeah. I mean, science and research, per definition, is kind of is a risk. I mean, that is the whole name of the game. Uh, you may win, you may find something fantastic, or it may fail. But as you were saying, the, the challenge we have had in Europe is that you do not want to recognize that maybe you didn't find what you were looking for. Uh, so that's something we should be much better at. Okay. Uh, maybe my last... We've literally last got a minute. So it's, we have to move away from short-term views to long-term mm. views. Mm. I mean, quite often, yeah. what in the short-term seen as a failure yeah. could be very much a big win in the long-term. Okay. So I'm just going to wrap this up. 30 seconds, please, each. This is my former TV... Uh, coming out here. I think just, I had my yeah, 30 seconds, so let's give bite. some time so to... Alberto, <laughs> yeah. putting you on the spot, from the Foundation's perspective, what is the next step in terms of achieving a partnership? Well, for the third time, <laughs> I would say to, to have some kind of example uh, in pilot, because I think yeah. it's crucial, and also Jerry underlined this mm. fact. Uh, but um, um, to go beyond that, uh, also to have uh, some kind of uh, um, table or uh, way to, to dialogue with the, the Commission at a practical level, um, in the next month, because uh, we have this uh, huge opportunity of being uh, ahead of schedule, let's say, and we, need, uh, we are talking about Horizon Europe, we are in 2019, probably we have more than one year, and uh, so we, we should uh, exploit it uh, very well. Okay, thank you. 
Well, we basically see that the European Commission with the next sort of horizon, uh, you know, has to be an anchor investor in this international AI for health research mm. collaborative that is mm. at the moment emerging. So that's for us the next step is working mm. closely with the new commissioner mm. as she is coming in and, and her team and moving that mm. forward. So, mm -hmm. Irene, a pilot next? What, what do you think should be the next step? Well, I would say that we have gained quite some experience already in the health field that we can really share. And I think we should really explore how we can use the type of partnerships we have elaborated with in Horizon 2020 in Horizon Europe. Uh, and I think it's, it's good for the foundations now to to look at the partnership areas which are proposed and the missions and see how you feel that you can contribute uh, you know, to achieve those objectives that are being set. And I mean, we are very open in all areas to, to discuss further with you and see how we can, uh, how we can go forward. Um, also, I, I think we should say that sort of there will be partnerships set up sort of in the first phase of Horizon Europe, uh, you know, in, that will be mentioned in the first strategic plan. But of course, Horizon Europe is a seven-year program, so there will be further partnerships set up. So there is no panic if we don't manage to come together and decide everything this month. Uh, you know, it's, it takes time. My experience in setting up partnerships, and, and I've set up a fair amount of them by now, um, it takes about two years mm. from the time you sit down with the right partners until you can launch something operationally. So let it take time. Don't rush. It's more important that we agree on what we should do and how we should do it, that we run and we fail. Mm. So that. And on, that, on those wise words, I'd like mm. to wrap it up. Thank you very much, mm. Irene Norstedt, uh, Stefan German, and Alberto Afonsi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.